We will now discuss how to use the Laplace transform to solve differential equations. In particular, we can take advantage of the fact that the Laplace transform tra converts differential equations into algebraic equations. We can still solve differential equations directly in the time domain using the homogeneous and particular solution, or instead, we can take this other route where we transform the differential equation into an algebraic equation solve the algebraic equation and then take that solution back to the time domain. And so this alternative um, can be preferred. In order to do that we need to understand the inverse Laplace transform. So the inverse Laplace transform is exactly the opposite of the Laplace transform. The Laplace transform takes a time function and generates a Laplace function. The inverse Laplace transform goes the opposite direction. And just like we were able to use these tables and properties to solve, to solve Laplace transforms, we can also use it to do inverse Laplace transforms. Ex except instead we look in the f of s column to look up what the corresponding f of t is. So let's do a couple of examples uh, to show how to, to solve the, for inverse Laplace transforms. So we'll start with this example. We have a constant 3, which we can factor out front of the inverse Laplace transform using the linearity property. And then if we look in the Laplace transform pair table, we can recognize the 1 over s plus 1 as having this form, where a is equal to 1. So the corresponding inverse Laplace transform of that is an exponential e to the minus at, where a is equal to 1. Therefore, that's our solution where the constant out front is still there. Again, we always make the assumption that our time functions start at t equals 0. So we add that, that quantifier. If we look at this solution, um, it turns out this is what we should have anticipated. If we looked at the poles of the Laplace function, where the poles are the values that make the denominator equal to 0, we can see that the poles or there's a single pole and it's equal to minus 1. The real part of the pole tells us the rate of decay or growth, so the fact that we have a negative real part of negative 1 shows us that we have a growth or a, a rate of decay of minus 1. And the fact that the imaginary part is non-existent or 0 means that we will have no oscillation, so we have no sine or cosine term. And so this is sort of what we should have expected. Here's a more complicated example. Um, if we looked at the poles of this transfer function, we would see that the poles are complex. So we would expect to get a decaying sinusoid. Uh, you know, if we have a real part, that'll give us an exponential, and the imaginary part will give us a sine or a cosine. And so the way that we can recognize this is to take this and first complete the square in the denominator. If you don't remember how to complete the square, I'll, I'll remind you very quickly. So the fact that we have a 4 as the coefficient of the s term, we take that, that term, 4, and divide it by 2 to give us 2. And so now we have a quantity s plus 2 squared. If we expanded this, we get s squared plus 4s plus 4. So that gives us the first two terms that we had on the left hand side but on the left hand side we had 13 not 4 and so in order to get 13 we need to add 9 which is 3 squared so that's how you complete the square and the reason that we did that is that it gives us a form that looks something like this um, which we saw in an earlier example where we had a damp sinusoid and so looking at this um, something that's different is uh, here we have omega squared, and in the numerator we have omega. So in, we don't want a 5 in the numerator, we want a 3. And the, so the way to achieve that is to multiply the numerator and the denominator by 3. Um, and dividing by, multiplying by 3 over 3 is like multiplying by 1. So in essence, we're not really changing anything. Um, 
And so we can bring this constant out front again by the linearity property, and we can bring the 3 in the, num in the denominator out front, and we get a constant multiplying something of that form. If we look at that, you know, we have uh, an s plus a term in an essence. That's what the s plus 2 is. And so that, that recognizes, um, we recognize that as a multiplication by an exponential in the time domain. This is that property number four. And if we take rid of the a, if we take rid of the shift, we have an omega divided by s squared plus omega squared, which we, if we look in the table, um, corresponds to a time function of sine omega t. So we can use this to give us a solution like this, um, where our f of t is going to be sine omega t, where omega is 3 and we're going to have e to the minus a t, where a is 2. And so that's the end result, where again the function uh, is 0 until time equals 0. And this is as we would have predicted. If we would have looked at the poles of this Laplace function, we would have had a real part of the pole of minus 2 and an imaginary part of plus or minus uh, 3, uh, 3 times j. Now that we understand how to, to, to employ the inverse Laplace transform, we can actually solve differential equations. And so the approach that we will use is, one, we'll take the differential equation, and we will apply the Laplace transform to make it into an algebraic equation. Then we will solve that algebraic equation to get x of s. And then finally, we'll take that solution and bring it back to the time domain using the inverse Laplace transform. So let's use this approach to solve this differential equation, x dot plus 3x equals e to the minus 3t. And we're given that the initial condition of x at time equals 0 is 0. So we could always solve this using homog the homogeneous and particular solution, but alternatively, we're going to use the Laplace transform. So the first step is to take the Laplace transform of the whole thing. And we can, again, use linearity to split this up over addition. Uh, the Laplace transform of a derivative, uh, if we look back at our old properties, uh, the Laplace transform of a derivative is equivalent to multiplication by s in the Laplace domain. So it's s times the Laplace function and then you also have to subtract x of 0. So this in brackets is the Laplace transform of x dot. We then take the Laplace transform of 3 times x. The 3 is just a constant that comes out front. The Laplace transform of a time function, small x, is, a, is, a, is the Laplace function, capital X. And then we can take the Laplace transform of this exponential where if we looked in our table, we would see that it's equal to, to 1 over s plus a, where in this case, our a is, is 3. So it's 1 over s plus a, where a is 3. Looking at our initial condition, we have that x of 0 is 0. The next step, step 2, is then to solve the algebraic equation. In essence, isolate x of s. So on the left-hand side of this equation, we have s times x of s plus 3 times x of s. So we can factor x of s out of that. When we factor x of s out, we're left with an s on that term and a 3 on that term. And then we can continue to solve for x of s by dividing by the quantity s plus 3. And that gives us x of s. The final step is then to take that solution back to the time domain using the inverse Laplace transform. So ultimately what we're trying to find is the solution in the time domain, x of t. We can find that by taking the inverse Laplace transform of x of s, where x of s is 1 divided by the quantity s plus 3 squared. Looking at this, we may recognize this quantity s plus 3 as a shift. Um, so we have a situation like s plus a, where our a is 3. We also may recognize that 1 over s squared 
is the Laplace transform of our ramp. And so if we combine those two facts, we get that the inverse Laplace transform of this whole quantity is e to the minus a t, where a is 3 times t. And again, our function doesn't begin until time equals 0. So there's an example of how to solve a, a simple differential equation. Uh, we will discuss some slightly more complicated uh, examples in the future. This concludes Module 3. To summarize what we've covered in this section is, is um, different mathematical models. So one, we looked at differential equations and how to interpret them uh, in order to understand uh, the, the form of the solution of these differential equations, where these differential equations will in general represent a physical system that we're interested in. You know, maybe a motor, uh, maybe a battery, etc. When the right-hand side of the differential equation is equal to zero, we have a homogeneous differential equation, and it represents the free response of the system. We can find this part of the solution by looking at the roots of the characteristic equation. The solution is uh, exponentials with the exponents being roots of the characteristic equation. If the right-hand side is not equal to zero, we have a forced response. Um, where we still have the natural response of the homogeneous solution, but then we also have a particular solution which will have the same form as the forcing function. We then introduce the Laplace transform as a tool. Uh, we like the Laplace transform because it makes some mathematical operations simpler. In particular, it makes differential equations algebraic equations, and that allows us to to solve differential equations in, a, in, a, in an easier way. And we can apply the Laplace transform using a table of Laplace transform pairs and a table of Laplace transform properties, some of which we discussed in lecture, but there are more that can be found in your book. We also learned some relationships between the Laplace domain and the time domain. You know, we like to work in the Laplace domain because the mathematics are easier but we need to understand what that means in the time domain because we, you know, we live in the, t in, in the, in, in the time domain. We live in a, in a world where, where we think of things in terms of time. So one relationship is that the poles of a Laplace function relate to the time function. In particular, the real part of the pole tells us the rate of decay or growth of the time function, and the imaginary part of the pole tells us the frequency of oscillation of the time function. And then we also learned the initial and final value theorems. These are things that we will come back to. Um, understanding poles is important. We'll come back to over and over again. The final value theorem is also especially important because it is an indication of the steady state behavior of a, of a system.